Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, good evening to you, and thank you for joining us for this um, invite on the uh, seminar, looking at supporting the training process, planning application, reviewing and recovering. So it's quite a broad topic area. And one of the reasons that is because we've been fortunate enough to have some great expert speakers agree to come and speak with us today, um, who I'll in introduce shortly and let them give themselves a little bit of a bio and background onto how they've got to where they are today. And then we'll dive into having a discussion. So I'm aware that some of the invites were scheduled for four hours. You'll be happy to know you don't have to listen to this um, English or Yorkshire accent for that amount of time. So it, this seminar will be 90 minutes to a couple of hours, depending on how the conversation goes. Um, the Q&A box is available in there. We did ask if anyone had any questions that they would email them before, which we have a list that we'll get through after the discussion points. But also if there's any questions throughout, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box and we will answer accordingly as well. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce our speakers and we'll go from left to right. So I'd like to introduce, first of all, Andy Gard, who is the sports scientist for US soccer. Then we've got Robin Thorpe, who's a sports performance consultant at the minute. And I'll let Robin go into some of his background as well as Andy. And then we've also got Martin Bashai, who's currently the head of performance at Kitman Labs, looking into the research side as well. So if I can ask Andy, if you can unmute and just give a brief background about what you're doing now and where you are and what your experience are in the past, please, if that's okay. Thanks very much, Steve. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, all loud and clear. Nice one. Uh, well, thanks very much for, for, for the invite and, and really great to, great to be here. Great to, to be on with, with uh, Martin and, and Robin uh, and yourself. Um, so my, my name is Andy Gard. I'm currently a sports scientist with, with US soccer, um, working mainly with the U23 and U20 men's national teams. Um, the U23 is gearing up towards Olympic qualification in the next few weeks. Um, I actually oversee the U18s up towards the A20, uh, U23s at the moment um, in the high performance department. Um, those are kind of my, my main teams and, and main remit with, within a, a high performance department at, at US soccer. Um, and prior to that, I was uh, over in Qatar, uh, in Doha at Aspire, Aspire Academy um, as one of their football physiologists. Um, and then before that, I was actually in Scotland uh, as a sports scientist with, with Celtic Football Club. Um, so moved around a little bit, um, but yeah, enjoying life uh, in a cold Chicago right now. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate that. I'm looking forward to hearing about um, that wealth of experience as well. Robin, over to you. Cheers, Steve. Um, so back in... 2009, I started as a, a sports scientist uh, and conditioning coach at Manchester United Football Club. Um, I was there a decade and um, I had roles such as head of recovery and senior sports scientist. I did a applied PhD whilst at Manchester United looking into monitoring of recovery fatigue um, and how that can be applied um, so essentially on the front line with, with the players. Um, since then, I moved to the United States to, um, to work with Olympic athletes, particularly sprinters in the lead up to uh, Tokyo 2020 or 2021, as it is now. Um, and I actually since moved to a more consultant type role um, with uh, an NBA team, a baseball team, and also with Intel Corporation. Um, looking into new 3D technology. Cheers, Robin, and thank you very much for that. And Martin, over to you now. Um, just to excuse um, myself, I'm having a few technical issues with the video for some reason, but you should be able to see Andy and Martin as well, who are much better looking than me anyway. So I'll let you look at them rather than myself. Martin, over to you for a brief introduction, if that's okay. If you can unmute, please. Martin, are you there? Sorry, like uh, just not able to hear you. There yeah. you go. Oh, oh yeah, my, my mistake. Uh, cheers, um, Steve. Thanks for the invite. Um, I was just saying that I hate introduction, so I think you, you you did the half of the job saying that I work for Kitman at the moment. Uh, 
been working before in uh, in Paris Saint Germain, Aspire as as MD, a uh, bit of pieces uh, in uh, consulting different sports, and uh, that's it for, for for me at the moment. No worries. Thank you very much, Martin. And again, thank you to the three of you for allowing again spending your time this uh, lovely Wednesday afternoon, evening, morning. Um, across the different time zones, so I appreciate it as well. So I think what we'll we'll do is just dive into kind of like exploring the broad topics. And the idea of this chat is to try and keep it as informal a process as possible, and to provide experience and anecdotal um, insights from yourselves about your experiences as well. So I appreciate you sharing them in advance. So really, and I'll. I'll go in that same order just for this first one and we'll mix it up and go. But if you can give give a broad overview of kind of like your current training processes and kind of your philosophies when it comes to the planning and application of the training as well. So Andy, if you can start us off, please, if that's okay. I'm unmuted. Yeah, of course. Thanks, thanks Steve. I think, um, I think initially just... Uh, just kind of touching on some of the, the main kind of uh, facets and, and roles in terms of the, the physical performance coach or, or whatever kind of title you have these days. I think our, our kind of remits as a, as a group are, are trying to kind of maximize, maximize fitness, freshness, um, make sure our teams and players are available for the coach. Um, but he has, has a kind of a full and fit squad to, to choose from come, come game day. Um, and I think tied in with that is, is, is making sure that throughout the process, there's a, there's a really good communication with, with technical staff, the, the coaches you work with, um, as well as the medical and, and other support staff, doctors around you. Um, so a really kind of multidisciplinary uh, aspect to it. And so there's kind of continued communication throughout the process and um, everyone contributes and kind of everyone's on the same page. So I think I'd kind of lead in with that um, as, a, as a premise, but I think um, philosophies wise and, and planning wise and, and those types of things I think I, I look a lot of the, the kind of the game schedule what the competition schedule looks like um, how how the season or, or the kind of the cycle ahead looks um, in terms of when there's potent, potentially congested um, fixture kind of periods uh, maybe there's, there's there's kind of um, more gaps between fixtures and there's, there's more time for recovery or, or type of training to, to emphasize certain training training loads and, and kind of um, physical stimuli. So I think it's important to, to kind of work back from, from kind of the game schedule, whether you have one game a week, maybe two, even three games a week, depending on kind of the league you're in. Um, I think then that, that then helps to kind of form in my head um, how I'm going to go about planning that, that weekly training process or, or maybe several weeks or, or, or a month in, a, in, in that cycle. So I think an understanding of the, the fixture demands and schedule ahead of you. Um, but then also really taking into account um, what, what the coach I'm working with, how, how they want to play, what's their system of play, um, informing how they want, we want to train those players to prepare them uh, and making sure they can kind of carry out what the coach wants them to do as a team and, and as an individual in, in a certain position uh, effectively come game day. And I think that's where kind of the whole multidisciplinary thing comes in. Um, that we're, we're working together off, off the same hymn sheet and the goal of, of working as the, the manager wants them to, that's that, that and then informs how I need to prepare them. Um, so working back from the game, using that, that kind of system of play or manager's philosophy to inform that, and then I can kind of hope, hope to um, marry the, the physical with the kind of the technical, tactical um, preference of the coach and, and again, be, be successful come, come game day. So uh, I think initially that's, that's the main couple of things. And then there's a huge amount of context, which I'm, I'm sure the other guys will get into as well, um, to consider in terms of what we're giving the players um, on a certain stage of the season, whether it's pre-season, uh, in-season, uh, for, for example, and, and how that affects what we give the players. Um, again, positional role, the age of the players, even gender, these, these types of things are going to come into it, um, as well as any, any other kind of specific nuances of our league, um, travel, uh, other environmental conditions and how we prepare the players um, in a certain week uh, and then kind of going moving forward um, into, into a larger time period. So that's kind of just an initial overview of, of things I consider. Thank you, Andy, and really appreciate that in-depth look. And I suppose the same question to you, Robin. It'd be interesting to hear whether or not actually during the transition into working with those different sports, 
after being in football so long, has that actually influenced your training process and philosophies or are they still consistent from when you started? I think, first of all, it's a very, very, very broad It, it is, you're right. <laughs> um, and you know what? I think the first thing that springs to mind, and, and you'll appreciate this, is um, so the FA um, a number of years ago had a, a, a qualification for fitness coaches um, working in the Premier League. And, and we were both, we both sort of partook in that. And at that time, and I think you'll, you'll remember, I think when it came to, say, pre-season planning and philosophy, it was probably a little bit of the traditional, almost block periodization model for football, which that was, that was the case then. But I think when I started at Manchester United and then you start to go, you start to work under different managers that are from different cultures and different philosophies. I think you, you soon find out that, well, number one, I don't think the block periodization model works at all in a football environment, but there's so many different ways to plan and to essentially put a process for conditioning players in football. And I think from my early, I remember back in 2009 and 10, I was thinking, oh, this planning of pre-season is such a, a complex and complicated process. And there's this one way of doing it. We need to start with building an endurance base, then moving into more speed endurance, and then moving it down into to more speed work. And I think when you you go through work with different managers from different cultures and different philosophies, you, again, you soon realize there's many ways to skin a cat. And in fact, in terms of, I think, football and the, the technical component to that, um, I think we probably need to, to give that more appreciation as a group of fitness coaches and condition staff um, than maybe that we, we do, and particularly that I did at the, at the start. I mean, one example is I remember we signed Paul Pogba one year and he trained for three days and then the manager played him straight away because he'd, he'd not been training all pre-season because of the transfer situation and he was man in the match for that first game. So I think that puts into context a little bit our role or our roles as sort of conditioning staff and the importance of a sort of one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to a, a training process or philosophy. So, I mean, that's, I think, for, for me, when I look at some of these topics, the one thing that stands out and the way I've developed and learned, and again, the different coaches from different cultures and, and Martin will, uh, will know all about this as well. They have very, very different ways of, again, if we're talking about pre-season to begin with, of creating that fitness or ad adaptation stimuli to the, to the players. So I think a lot of it would be all about can we as a, as a staff or a practitioner adapt to what that technical model would be. Um, so I think that's where I'd start, first of all, from a, let's say, a training process. I think we'll probably move on to recovery, et cetera, a little bit later on. Well, cheers, Robin. I think that nicely leads into uh, Martin, since you mentioned him. So Martin, over to you for that first one, please. Uh, yes, I just, I, I can just agree with what has been said, of course. So, um, but yeah, maybe to, to, to follow up a little bit with what Robin has just been saying about the, it's just impossible to, to, to plan or roll. Um, so I'm always like to say about it just more not doing what is ideal, but doing the least bad option most of the time. So managing the, managing the chaos, managing players coming back from either holidays or international duties a week before the start of the season um just everything so it's more about being very very i would say adaptable to everything that comes from game schedule game from travels or or, or whatever and uh, i think th the best plan is not a plan the best plan is just being able to to adapt on, almost almost on the fly um and to have this ability to adapt on, on the fly, uh, you have to have a pretty good base, both an understanding on what should be done or not, but also a base in terms of, of structure. 
So even if it's chaos, uh, I want to make sure I do properly these types of activation for this group of players. I want to make sure those players, they receive a minimum strength work because they need it and so on. So, I mean, it's really having everything in, in mind, be prepared to, to, to adapt. But uh, yes, we are, we are very far from, uh, from what would be ideal. But I guess it comes with, um, with the type of clubs you, you work with as well. You know, you just play probably, I guess, in, in the MLS, you may have sometimes less, uh, less games than we have sometimes in Europe at Christmas, for example. But you have those, those big travels midweek. So it's different types of constraints, but you have to adapt as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. And thank you to you all. And I suppose le leading on from that and just going off piece a little bit, there's uh, quite a few um, college and university practitioners actually on the call who from a training process, and this applies to many people, especially during COVID times as well, is the congestion of fixtures is becoming more prevalent before. And I know Robin's done a lot of work with this, but I'll start off with you, Martin, see so we went last on you. But what's kind of like the process for you? We talked about working backwards, but during those kind of fixture congestions, how hard is it to actually plan and structure training accordingly with the different groups of players you have in there? I would say it's actually, to me, it's actually easier because there's no much uh, options, you know? You played, you played a bit or you did not play. And everyone has to be ready for the next day in three days. So there's not much discussion about what do we, which day do we load, day plus three, day plus four. Uh, there's way room, there is way less room for, I would say, discussion about the, the, the training patterns of the week and so on. And in that sense, you just have to make sure those who played a lot, they recover and no more. And those who did not, that you make sure you compensate enough. And this is what I've been always probably enjoying the most is think about compensation sessions to make sure that subs get loaded enough so that they keep obviously the momentum and the fitness, but not too much because there's another game coming soon. So are you, are you topping up? Are you training them, the subs immediately after the game, the day after a bit of both? What do you do during those compensation sessions? There's lots to, to, to think about, but for the others, it's, it's easy. Recover, play, recover, play. I suppose because from a coach's point of view, I suppose that Rob, Robin, you might want to hit on this, is that actually the, the sometimes the need or want from coaches to get everyone out on the pitch and get them back training as quickly as possible. So what's kind of like, from what Martin said, to kind of transition into that whole planning of training and recovery, what's kind of your take on that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think from the, the sort of fixture congestion piece, um, I know actually Martin and Stephen Smith did a little piece um, around Christmas time about more the sort of sequence of, of fixture congestion rather than this sort of total amount of games um, per se, which is something that we looked at a few years ago um, in the Premier League and, and found that there was, a, there was certainly a discrepancy between teams and, and something that we put a lot of effort into trying to understand between our players um, and their exposure to the sort of sequencing rather than the total amount of game time. So I think that's important to, when we talk about fixture congestion, we probably need to be a little bit more detailed of the sort of exact nature of that congestion. Um, and again, there's that, that Kitman Labs article is really good to, to explain that and highlight that. Um, from a sort of real world perspective, and you're right, I think there's, there's certainly that nuance of, I would say managers are old school coaches and and again when they were playing it was they would like to be back on the sort of field or the pitch every day uh, and again there's those old school type approaches of sort of like blow the cobwebs away from getting back on the pitch and maybe running the day after games um, and that was certainly the case in um, the early sort of years when I like sort of 10 years ago in the Premier League where you still had that old school player I would say or approach particularly I would say from a British perspective and I think throughout the years we would probably um, 
see more of the sort of continental type type of player and more I would say variation in how players would respond to stress and load, but also their particular needs and what they prefer to do. And again, that that will probably come into the sort of recovery piece a little bit later on in terms of preference and perceived nature of recovery. But for another example, a couple of years ago, we had a player, a South American player, who the day after a game, he had to run. That was what he wanted to do. And so, I think, mean, again, talking about fixed congestion, keeping players fresh or keeping players risk-free, um, I think there's certainly a balance to be made between what a player prefers to do and their belief effect of what's right for them and then also what we feel as a, as a group of staff is, is, is right for them from, a, again, keeping them risk-free. So I think there's definitely a balance to be made and we have to think about cultures and, again, staff and manager philosophies. Um, for me personally, we, um, we had a, a good culture for, for monitoring and for applying sort of real world science. And we were able to start to collect various sort of data points, which gave us an indication of particularly what would be the best scenario, let's say the day after a game, when we were in a sort of fix of congestion um, time, um, whether that would be sort of more recovery style sessions instead of being out on the pitch or whether or not certain players were actually, you know, what they're ready to go again, let's try and load them. I think, again, this is, I'm probably going off on a tangent a little bit. Sports science has been quite renowned for sort of holding players back. Um, but I think with a, with a sort of solid monitoring piece, it's about maybe optimising any sort of training opportunity. Um, so I think the main point, and to summarise I think there'll be individual differences between players. So if we can try and understand those differences, I think we could probably optimise the training process for everyone. Um, but again, the coaches and the players' perspective and their beliefs, I think, is really important to, to understand in, in order to, again, create the best process um, during fixed congestion for players who are playing and players who are not. I no, appreciate that, Robin. I think we'll, I'll probably come back and ask you a few more bits on that. And I suppose coming to you now, Andy, just on what Robin mentioned, obviously we've heard a lot about potentially the first thing about given you've worked within the national setup and the youth age groups as well, kind of, are there any adaptations to what Martin and Robin have said that you would like to add? Yeah, I mean, I think take, taking those points on again, I think that they both, Martin and, and Robin mentioned kind of not just the, the amount of games, but the density is, is really, really important. And when you look at your calendar and your schedule, how how, how close they are together and where you have periods to, to try and load the players a bit more, as, as Robin said, or um, I think Martin mentioned as well, like what, what you do with your subs. I mean, the just, just again, slightly off on a tangent that, the, that difference between your regular starting players or, or the people who start start on the, the start of a, a congested period, um, you need to compare those guys and not forget about the, the non-starting group who, who get 10, 15 minutes every week. And I think that that difference between physical dose uh, on, a, on a game day is just going to get exacerbated more and more as the season goes on. So the importance of, of that kind of post-game match day plus one conditioning uh, where possible and, and how and where you do that is, as Martin says is, is really important I think if you can microdose and get a, a minimal effective dose of high speed running some sprint distance as well as some high level kind of neuromuscular change of direction behavior hopefully with some some kind of football and soccer involved as well um, then I think you're, you're, you're trying to tick some boxes but, but minimize that gap from, from getting any bigger so that when the, the coach does need that that substitute player for a, for a start in the next game that you've negated that or mitigated that um, that gulf or difference in load as much as possible. Um, with with respect to, to the to kind of the young players, I think Robin said it as well, is a lot of coaches have different kind of ask, um, voices on this. And I've, I've heard so many times that uh, oh, he's young or, or they're young and they can just kind of get on with it. I, I see that in a way sometimes, but uh, with, with kind of my sports science hat on, I, I know Kind of the, the physical demands that, that they've been through, which uh, we know are also continually evolving um, in, in soccer throughout the, the levels of play. Um, it's, it's getting more intense in terms of their outputs and what's required of these players. So we, we need to have kind of a bit of a, a, bit of a compromise there um, and a bit of a balance uh, in understanding that 
young players are still developing and they still need to train. Um, they need to kind of get that technical, tactical development as well as the physical side from, from our point of view. So I think that's important to remember from the, the young guys' point of view. Um, but on, on the other side as well, um, we can still microdose these things for young players. But if you're working in a college, for example, and, and I hear about these, these, these a lot um, with, with the guys that come in through our national teams, uh, these are student athletes as well. So there's, a, there's a lot of external stresses that, that come a part, a part of their kind of training, training load, as it, as it were. They've got exams, they've got, they've got classes, they've got... Um, we had a guy in a, in a camp a couple of weeks ago, he was finishing papers at midnight every night for the first five days of our camp because he was finishing classes at university and he was still managing to be in a national team camp. So we really had to factor that in, um, in terms of managing them, their sleep, their recovery um, modalities that we're making available to them. Uh, and also just kind of the mindset and, and wellness piece. Um, we really, really focused in on that guy. So it's very, very holistic. Um, and again, as the guys have reiterated, really individual, um, all of your players. Yeah, I appreciate that, Andy. And it reminds me of kind of like a personal experience. We, and I think you went to the La Manga Cup once with the US uh, female team, didn't you? And it's a tournament whereby you play three games in five days. And so it kind of like throws everything out the window with regards to planning because ultimately you're preparing players for, well, can you prepare players to be available for three lots of 90 minutes? And it's different, interesting when you talk about the different age groups and how they respond to that kind of stimulus as well. I suppose that brings me on to my next question is actually for, for a lot of the coaches, performance staff that are on the call now, I'll, I'll lead off with you, Robin, this time, if that's okay. It's how, how as not just um, sports science, how as coaches, as practitioners, do we actually help prepare the team? Because we talked a lot about how it needs to be individualized, but how can we actually try to plan for the team in order to get them prepared for three game weeks, for example? Well, again, I think it's a, it's a broad question. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and it probably leads a little bit off from what, from what Andy said. And I think, I mean, from my, my perspective, it's, it's about, I mean, it depends on like that, your preparation phase. I know during COVID preparation phases have declined massively, but in that preparation phase, I think that's where you're going to start to build that base level robustness or resilience or whatever you want to call it um so i think ensuring that again and, and from my background and, and and experience i think we can monitor athletes through various ways which and again that may only be asking players how they are coping so monitoring things like fatigue and, and say muscle soreness and ensuring that during that preparation phase you're optimizing every single day that is, I would say, from a risk mitigating perspective. So if a player is in a state to train and adapt, then making sure we make the most of that time. Because when we get into a season, if you are playing three times a week, um, and I think even this season, I think Tottenham played four games in seven days or something stupid like that. That's when some of those qualities that you've built up are going to be put into practice. And again, I think mean, once you enter that period of fixer congestion or playing three games a week for however many weeks, you don't have the time to to, to adapt through training. It's only going to be through through those games. And for some players, the adaptation through the games itself is going to be enough. But as we know, there's a fine line between um, that load and recovery and fatigue and, and whether or not players may break down. And again, Martin alluded to before, what about those players who aren't always playing and they're getting minutes here and there? Can we utilise those little bits in between games and the training process, enough adaptation for them to keep building resilience or adaptation or at least maintaining some of those qualities, hopefully, which have been established during that preparation phase. I think the, the, the problem or not, or not the problem, but the, the challenge at the moment is reduced preparation phases in all team sports and, and how, and again, we'll only probably know this 
come the end of the different team sports seasons, how some of these players have have responded or have coped. Um, there's a lot of media highlight to to increase injury rates this season, particularly in the Premier League and in European football. So possibly um, some of those reduced preparation phases may be um, may have played a part in that, and obviously the fixture congestion, the sequencing. But um, I think to summarise, I think uh, ensuring that you opt you optimise preparation phases, um, and I think the use of monitoring processes can help. And again, they don't have to be technology um, heavy. They can be quite simple. And again, just talking to your athletes. Um, but again, after that, it's it's managing that fatigue and recovery between games. And I think that's probably, again, I'll say it again, probably something we'll talk about um, a little bit later on when we talk a little bit more about recovery. No, I appreciate that, Robin. And I suppose, Martin, just coming to you on that, because obviously they... When we talk about, and Robin mentioned about the use of technology in that whole planning process and your experience from both using technology in the football world, but also when you start to um, look at planning conditioning sessions using like the hit science kind of uh, theories that you've pu published and produced over the years, what's kind of like your take on preparing that team for those kind of without calling it a worst case scenario, but preparing them to be ready for that really tough congested fixture period. Um, yeah, there's probably different angles to, to, to respond to that. Uh, on the, the, the technology side, I think, I definitely believe that at the moment we are probably where we need to be in terms of sensors, in terms of data collection, you know? I don't think having a more sensitive uh, GPS when it comes to tracking or, or the kind of uh, sensors will actually really be, be game changers. Um, but where the technology will definitely help is about allowing us to plan better. So bringing the information better, helping to make better decisions, which is, again, not the technology itself, but more the processes around that. So that's obviously the stuff that's been developed by, uh, by, by, by Kitman about the, those planning functions where um, that, that works with embedding uh, into the calendar some specific microcycles that you may have prepared before, ability to compare between planned load and actual the, the load that has been done, for example. So this is where I see definitely more the technology making an impact on, on helping us to, to make better informed in decision, let's say. Um, and then you mentioned heat science processes or this kind of stuff. Yeah, this is more about, again, the having in mind which are the requirements of certain types of drills so that you are sure that you're able to plan the drills that fit in your weekly plan. We're back to the work for the subs, for example. Uh, you know, you have maybe you have 15, 15, 20 minutes straight after a game to compensate a bit of the game that did not play. Um, if the next game is in a week, doesn't really matter what you do. But if the next game is in three days, you'd better make sure you utilize those 20 minutes uh, in an optimal way. So then becomes the idea of, OK, if because everyone does box to box after after a game, for example. Um, but there might be other ways to still get this cardio metabolic stimulus than just do going from a box to another, you know, trying to think about the neuromuscular demands that you might try to ingest at this time uh, so that you compensate the, the, this game again. And because what you don't do on game day, you have to do it on day plus one, and day plus one will, will already be day, day minus two, for example, you know. So, again, this is where. Uh, I'm back to what I was saying at the, at the start, really, to have the ability to, to really implement what's needed given, given the context. And this is where, again, the te technology in terms of more, could be uh, yeah, an AMS or these kind of solutions can help you to understand what needs to be done on a given day. And then if you have this knowledge or access to drill databases, for example, that would probably help you to make sure you tailor the right drills for the for the right time. Well, thank you, Martin. I suppose just to finish up on that, like when 
like when coaches and practitioners are looking at trying to establish that do you, like from your experience is it better to use like what they've done in a game for example to set those training loads what's expected of them in a game is it actually what are they maximally capable of and kind of how do you look at trying to provide those insights and making it relevant to the target audience uh, still, still for me the question or? sorry uh it's the yorkshire accent martin um so basically like so for example if i was if i was planning uh training i would always relate it to what um a player had done within match play or their worst the highest physical outputs within games and also the technical information that we exposed to. So are there any specific kind of methods when you were using that data that you then went to plan your programs with as well? Yes, I, th I think this is where we have to be very careful of when we just focus on game demands as uh, targets when it comes to designing some drills. Because if you go too far into that, um, you might not hit some certain target targets either. You know, especially when you look at when we think about game demands. That's we all we all talk about the running, the locomotor demands, which is already a clear reduction of what a game is. And if you were just trying to replicate game demands, um, simple example, you want to compensate or replicate the high speed running demands of a game. But that, that can be done in four or five minutes of box to boxes, which doesn't really make sense overall if you think about compensating the high speed running of a game with an exercise that lasts for five minutes. So for sure, you may have tick tick boxes saying, OK, I've done the same amount, but the way you actually reach this distance is completely different. Um, so what matters the most, to accumulate the same distance or to reproduce something that actually reflects more the way this distance has been accumulated. Then it comes to the time you have, the distance, the, the space you have, what can be implemented. So if you only have those 15 minutes after the game, fair enough, let's do it. But if you have time to do more, same day, day after, then it's uh, it, it's something uh, probably more, more relevant. So game demands, I think it's interesting, the, the overall concept, but you have to make sure you understand a bit as the example I've just gave, that it's always more than just numbers accumulation. Um, and just quickly on that, I'll, I'll let the other, the other speak as well, you know. Um, on the metabolic aspect, because we think, again, if I take this example that everyone does, you see that those box to box, this is the, that's, yeah, that's, so the problem, the, the, the problem is that box to box comes with both the metabolic stimulus and the, the running demands. So you get a, in five minutes, you get a bit of a bit of both. But again, in five minutes, you've done maybe enough or even more than your game demand in terms of running. But if you look at the metabolic component of a game, of course, five minutes is only five minutes. Even if it's five minutes at high intensity, there's likely that you spend more than five minutes uh, during your game. So you, 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 might just, you, may have, you may say then, let's do two times five minutes or three times five minutes. Because for the metabolic aspect, you want to do more volume. But then you'll say, oh, fuck, I'm going to do two Ks of high speed running, which is twice or three times my match. How do I do? And again, this is where we have to understand that you don't need to run box to box to get the metabolic stimulus. And you can reach the metabolic stimulus doing other types of runs, for example. So you can get this volume at the metabolic level while still managing and controlling the, the demands. And it's not that complex, but at least needs to have this understanding or understanding ahead of implementing the drill. What do you want? You want the volume overall, you want the locomotor volume, you want the metabolic volume and so on. And um, it's just said and done. I mean, it, this has to be un un understood and, and planned accordingly then to me. Just to add to that as well, Steve. Um, so two points, because um, I, I agree with Martin. Um, completely. I think the first thing, obviously, having what Martin just said in mind, I don't think it really matters also how we sort of, I mean, it does matter how we sort of rationalize and contextualize the data. But if we're talking about communicating with coaches, they need to understand it. And can you explain it to them appropriately, as with the points that Martin have just made? But 
so they understand it. If 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 I understand it from whatever perspective, but the coach or the other or the manager doesn't understand that, then who cares? I mean, you you're losing that communication link anyway. Um, so that's that's my first point in terms of the contextualization of the data. And then the second one, I think what Martin described also happens in the re the rehab and the return to play process as well, where sometimes we can get lost in, well, let's just tick a few boxes or check a few boxes that are right, okay, we've done a thousand meters of sprint distance in just in five minutes. But how how does that look in reality? Because you we need to start to implement these things under fatigue as well. I think that's an important um concept to try and think about in that return to play or return or re rehabilitation process is if we're going to do some of these high-end locomotive actions um or stress yeah it's 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 well and good doing it in five minutes um in a fresh state but how do the athletes or how does the the process and the system look doing that type of work under a fatigue state or again if you're adding all the different physiological systems to that process as well so I think that again it doesn't just happen from a a fit player perspective in the training process I think that's something we need to probably do a better job of in the rehab the rehab process and again educating maybe the clinical and medical practitioners um, accordingly as well. No I appreciate that Robin thank you it's Great conversation. I thought that match demand might get you sparked, Martin. So thank you for going into the details much. I suppose for you and Andy as well, when you start to think about the planning process and that you've got players coming from all different clubs, all different environments, you might so it'd be interesting to hear like kind of what's your take on that from the national team though, but then previously when you're in the academy as well, if that's okay. Yeah, of course, mate. It's 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 very different, obviously. Being being with the the, the national team uh, in that setup is is very different to being in the club day to day. Um, we're we're remote where we are. Our players are remote in relation to where we, where we are, and our, our U23 players, for example, are spread out all over Europe, Central America, South America, uh, as well as here in the MLS. So it's um, it's all about communication. I think is is the first thing. Um, and, and being able to generate as much kind of pertinent information and as I can to, to provide to our coaching and, and medical staff. Um, all all the, the players in the US obviously have a very different season to what it is in the Europe. So that's that's one kind of issue um, in terms of managing those guys who are maybe in an off season compared to an in season. And I think we touched on it earlier. Um, Rob, Robin had said how kind of condensed that European um, off seasons are. When when I was in Scotland, it was, it was kind of four, four weeks maybe at the most before the first team are back for Champions League qualifiers. Um, whereas here, I've, I've had players um, in, in our national team pool who will finish competitive league fixtures in, a, in October, late October, early November, uh, and not be back in pre-season, potentially end of, end of kind of January. So it's, it's really, really different in that respect. And, and we've definitely kind of run into uh, challenges, um, particularly when, when it comes to kind of January in, in the US when uh, players are, are kind of in the coming towards the end of their off season, but we traditionally have a, a January camp, which is outside of the FIFA calendar. But that's that's kind of quite a tradition within US soccer, the senior teams and, and some of the youth teams. So again, communication with, with the clubs is, is really, really important from kind of my point of view to, to make sure I understand what, what the players are doing in terms of the programs that, that are being run by, by the, uh, the clubs uh, for, their, for their conditioning, as well as their, their strength work and strength development, particularly with young players who we are still trying to develop on the field, um, technically, tactically, as, as well as from a physical point of view, as, as they're growing and, and maturing. So, yeah, um, being being on that kind of uh, communication loop and, and feeding it back constantly to, to make sure we know the 25 players uh, who are coming into our camp, we know where they're at, where they are in their stage of the season, what they've been doing in terms of kind of their, their training for the previous four weeks um, and, and how much kind of base or, or chronic load have, have they built up um, because we need them flying when they come into a national camp. Um, obviously, sometimes that, that isn't always kind of possible. It's not always ideal, but it's up to us as a staff to kind of uh, mediate that as best we can with, with the, the load we and, and kind of recovery opportunities we provide them to, to e integrate them safely to our environment and then send them back safely to their club as well. So basically, it comes down to constant communication to, to know what, what the guys are doing, what they, their tolerance can be and what their exposures have been. Um, 
as well as what their previous previous kind of data and loads they can provide to us. Um, any nutritional regimens they're on, any strength and conditioning specifics we need to kind of continue, uh, injury histories, uh, and any kind of correctives they're on. I think gathering as much holistic information as we can gives us a really good picture in terms of where these players are at and if there's any specific nuances or individuals we really need to manage, uh, integrating them in um, for our camp, where, wherever we may be. No, I appreciate that, Andy. And it's, it's always a difficult task working with international players, and especially when it... I can imagine when you get all the training data in, like you just go, right, how do I train that person the same as this person and so on? And I suppose that's going to bring me on to the next question. This is quite a specific um, example. It'd be interesting to get everyone's thoughts. Is where We talked about conditioning and planning the conditioning and supporting starters, non-starters and so on. So and Martin men mentioned it about the whole concept of these box-to-box -box runs. Like... The concept of football being on a continuum with running seems to be quite apparent with some coaches, with some practitioners, that you can't do one. You have to do one or the other. Like, what's the best kind of message you've found in order to to use both, for example? So I would say with one coach, um, like the adoption of kind of when the high end model was introduced, but when you went to the small size pitches, obviously the lack of high speed exposure potentially, if, if you do end up chasing numbers, which I'm not saying is right, being able to complement that with the metabolic kind of stress that you get from the 4v4 small size pitch to then doing MAS style runs or bo the more box to box style runs, we used to do 15 on 15 off. So kind of like, that's an example of kind of the strategies that I found. Use what do you, what would you guys recommend as kind of like a specific example that you found that's been really successful with getting both the kind of metabolic stress, the high, high speed extensive kind of work, and so on. And I'll go to Miss Doctor Thorpe first for that, if that's all right. Yeah, I'll be I'll be pretty quick. Um, I think the most success that I or we had was probably technical based drills interspersed with um, running based drills as well. So, and again, and the running based drills would be depending on the phase of whether we're talking about pre season or in season, would be related to the sort of physiological emphasis that was required at that particular point. So, again, it could be maybe more box to box based sort of aerobic endurance base. And then sometimes it may be more short repeat sprintability type work as well. So I think, again, in summary, it would be technical based drills interspersed with, with, with running based drills. And again, we used to do a lot of sort of, it'd be, again, these intervals would change according to what phase we were at. But um, again, it could be, it could be four minute blocks, for example. Um, and again, I think an, an example, a real world example would be, I think a few years ago, and this was under um, Jose Mourinho, we would have the, the players who weren't involved on match day, we would then, they would be brought into the training ground to, to train and we would do small again, because there was never that many players. So we were only able to do sort of small sided based um, technical drill um, work, but we would always intersperse that with, with running blocks as well, and we would try. And, and that's it. So I think, I think actually, to summarise, in pre-season, you're usually trying to work on a physiological emphasis, but during the season, on that sort of game day scenario example of the players who aren't in the squad, um, we would try and maybe tick as many of those physiological systems as possible during that one hour long session or seventy minute session. Um, other examples would be that other managers wanted those players, um, say it was a home game at the stadium, and then they would change and join the substitutes who didn't play in a similar type of session post-match in the stadium. And again, that would, there would be many factors involved there in terms of what we could actually do and time. Um, but from that perspective, it was it was mainly running. And again, we had a, a bespoke post-match running based only session as well for substitutes 
um, who didn't play or only maybe played 10, 20 minutes. Um, again, this goes in line with what we've previously spoken in trying to get them in line with with players who are playing um, as quickly and as efficiently as, as possible. I was going to say, I bet the ground staff used to love you at Old Trafford, didn't they? I thought we got on quite well. It was the away, it was the away stadiums that were the problem. Yeah, I, I think that's generally like one of the biggest issues I found. Like at home games, we used to do small sided games interspersed with the runs, and like just and again get those non squad players or match their squad players involved as well, so, so everyone could, from a psychological point of view, have that day off on a Sunday. Yeah, um, that's, that's one thing though. I think sorry to cut you off. No, um, go for it. I think sometimes we can get caught up in the specificity too much, though, as well. Like, if it's after a game and you've got a substitute who's not played, they're already pissed off. Like, we don't want to be trying to sort of be over-specific. Let's just try and get the, the the sort of adaptation we're looking for or the stress we're looking for from load in as quick and efficient way as possible. Because, again, as the guys will know, these players, are, and they're not happy from not playing, and to ask them to go out on a a windy, rainy, rainy night in Newcastle or Stoke, wherever it may be, is like it's that's where you've got to have the art and that relationship um, part of your role to, to try and persuade them. And you know what? Listen, you might be involved next week, so let's try and keep you in in a position to to be ready to compete. I was going to say I never had that issue in uh, sunny sunny Hull City. So, um, or to be fair, when away with England and that, it was always sunny in like La Manga, which I know is near where Martin's living now. So, like, for for you, Andy, how like how have you found that kind of process as well? Any specific like hints or tips that you found that work really well? Yeah, I think uh, Robin made a good point at the end there. We've I've definitely had players in the past where they you, you've come up to them at the end of the game and said, right, it's going to do a few minutes work now. They either didn't get on or, or they got a few minutes and. And they've turned and looked at me like, yeah, good luck with that, no, no chance kind of thing. But um, I think he, I think he's right. Um, it's, it's putting it in, in the context for them that we need them to do something to, to be ready. Um, they could be called upon at any moment. Um, and there's a bit of creativity there. So it's not just running them into the ground for, for a few minutes post-game uh, on the field and where well, you're just kind of going to lose them. You may not get the effort and the intensity you need for, for, for that. So uh, in the past, I've, I've kind of, uh, in collaboration with the, with the technical coaches, maybe the assistant coaches, um, will we'll devise more positional stuff, um, whether, it, whether it's a, a forward uh, or, or wide, a wide player, maybe working in combination. If there's a couple of the players or three or four of them, uh, and we can work out some kind of patterns of play uh, that involve multiple players uh, that end up with a cross and a finish, for example, just to kind of get that buy-in, maybe, maybe use the, the reserve goalie as well. Um, and you, we can still figure out um, what we're getting from in terms of a physical response, um, both cardi- cardiovascularly as well as kind of um, neuromuscularly. Um, it's a bit more specific. I know Rob Robin said we don't always want to be as specific as possible, but I think in these kind of uh, in these environments or these scenarios, we need to be to get some the buy-in and, and get some of these load into the players, and it's in a in a positional fashion. Um, with, with regards to, to some of the kind of the conditioning, just as, as um, uh, Martin and, and Robin have mentioned before, we, we, we've done pretty similar. We On a Wednesday, one of our harder training days in, in Scotland, we, we would do a, a similar block of kind of four minute rotations between the, between three or four teams, uh, maybe three teams uh, with one team off. Uh, one team maybe working on, uh, sorry, two teams will be working 4v4, 5v5, 6v6, depending on our numbers. Uh, another team may be off running, whether that is box to box, 15 on, 15 off, that we could be pretty confident about, or 10 on, 20 off, um, reps of eight, sorry, sets of eight. Um, but we also did kind of more maximal sprint speed stuff across the box, 40 yards worth, five, six seconds running, um, 30, 35 seconds rest, and just five or six really kind of maximal reps that they're not going to get in the small sided. Um, we could build up to maybe eight, eight, four minute blocks on that session. So it's a really kind of quick, short, sharp hour at the most. Um, but we could be pretty confident about some of the, the stimuli we're, we're getting the players and we know they're going to get kind of 15, 20 minutes um, above 85% heart rate max, for, for example, to, for their kind of adaptive purposes. Um, but they're getting a, a really good neuromuscular as well as technical load um, in the soccer too. So. I think there's like different different ways to skin a cat, but that was one of our kind of go tos um, midweek. Brilliant, Andy. Cheers for that. And coming to you, Martin, and I suppose like 
I know you make quite a lot of reference to um, the different weapons you can choose as part of your hit science. And for anyone that's on the um, attending it this night or watching the recording of this, like if you haven't read some of Martin's hit science stuff with Paul Larson, I'd recommend it. But I'll let you speak about any specific weapons that you would choose, Martin. And I know Robin's probably going to itch in with another question after this as well. Um, I, th I think, yeah, how Robin started to, to answer just, just before, I think that's definitely the, the, the vision I, I share, um, using the best of, of each. So, because you know, each types of, of, of weapon, if you want to reuse this, this terminology, has its own uh, both interest and, and limitations. So like everything in life, if you just use too much of one thing, it's, it's, it's never good, you know? So um, if you really want to keep the motivation, the, the, the more specific type, types of stimulations in terms of keeping the decision making, the, the, the Excel, the D-Sales, uh, the sm small sided games are the, of course, the, 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 the tool of, of greatest interest. But because we know that these are have also some limitations, like it's very difficult to modulate the load. It's very difficult to 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 get uh, some high speed uh, in, into those drills. Um, they might have some players that, that, that don't get the, the the metabolic load you're after just because they don't get as much as 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 the others the ball or whatever. So this is obviously the, the preferred option, the preferred weapon to 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 do everything uh, game based. But because of the limitation of game base, you, have, you may have to sometimes choose other types of drill for the, the, the reason I mentioned, control, high speed, or maybe doing something that is sometimes a bit less, um, less, less, less lactic, if, you, if, if, if I can use the, the term, you know. As soon as you play three by three, four by four, you get a good neuromuscular conditioning. You get, of course, uh, VO2 values close to max, but this comes with lactate production. And maybe you don't want to spend the whole session producing lactate because that's also something you're going to have to, to recover from the next day if the next, if the next game is in a couple of days. You'll have to, 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 to digest this session. So we know that depending on how you shape those more run-based types of drill, when I say run-based, that doesn't mean that you can, you can still not introduce the ball but it won't be won't be based game based uh, game based sorry that means you may be, be able to reproduce uh, running patterns of the typical running patterns that player doing games and finishing by a pass a shot or, or whatever but depending on the duration of those efforts depending on the, the rest the work rest ratio you can control uh, the anaerobic lactic participation and i think this is probably something we tend to, to forget also because this is pretty important for me to keep sometimes lactate production in check, especially when you have uh, little time between uh, between sessions. So again, I think I'm kind of repeating myself. It just it's just about knowing what you want and having the tools to to fit them at the right moment in in the in in, in the puzzle in the weekly puzzle. But for sure, it will be always a combination of of everything. And again, to echo once more, uh, Robin. The more you can do through technical drills, the better. For uh, all levels, coordination, uh, concentration, motivation, specificity. And again, back to my comment about just taking volumes, GPS volumes, um, that would be definitely like you just go, you just imagine you, like speed types of repeated efforts. You could do again some run based box to box or even sprinting drills versus situation with the ball, the, the, the wingers or the fullback, they have to go deep, cross, sprint back, the, the, the attackers, they do some specific uh, movement and then they just, they just play deep in the back of the defenders. They, you, you imagine this kind of situation, we have a lot of, of depths to introduce distance so that you can really reach higher speed. Just those, those actions will be way more specific, both on a neuromuscular aspect, because you will have turns, you will have balls, you will have torso rotations on the top of the speed, but also just the work rest ratio will kind of, depending on how many players you have in the rotation, but those, 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 those drills will actually allow players to accumulate this distance that you've been chasing through your GPS in a way more organic way than if you were just putting uh, players running in between cones. 
So if you manage to organize that, and that means you have a great relationship with the, 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 the technical coaches who are actually in charge of, of that, just playing with rotation, spaces, distance uh, in, in between or time and distance, you can reproduce something that is, uh, I mean, at a high level, both in terms of demands, motivation and uh, specificity, which is to me always uh, the goal. But it's not always easy to be able to organize that uh, for many reasons. So that sometimes you have just to go a little bit backward and say, okay, I'm doing something a bit less specific, less integrated, but at least I'll hit my physiological target. Uh, but if you can get both, happy days, of course. Cheers, Martha, as well. And I suppose just on that point, when you're actually pl planning, whether it be a week, a month, a season, kind of, was there a conscious effort with yourself and the coaching staff that you worked with to incorporate that physical with the technical actions as well? And if so, was there any way that you particularly did it that you would be happy to share? Yeah, that would, that would happen, depend, depending on with who, depending when. But that's always been the goal, of course, yeah. No, no, isn't like I suppose coming back to you, you Andy, working like with some of the different coaches. I know obviously there was a big influence like in your early career from kind of Kenny and the four fours with the dribble track and so on. So kind of like, was there any conscious effort, with, especially from the youth side and the like the development pathway that you worked with, to incorporate those technical actions within the planning process? So did you actually? like what we planned for a week with uh, physical outputs, was that conscious effort from a technical or tactical aspect with the coaches to align? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's still apparent now, even, even with the national team, um, partly because we don't have as much time with the players with the national team. So we, we don't want to spend too much time just, again, just running them and doing kind of generic fitness work. Um, so we try and get the, the fitness through the, the football, through the soccer. Um, in, in the way that the coach wants. Um, and yes, in, in the academy, it would also be in line as it is now with, with the, um, kind of the, the theme themes of the day or, or that week. So building up from midfield or building up from the back, um, what, does he, what do we want our, our kind of wide players to do, our fullbacks and our, and our, and our, our wingers? How can we kind of replicate that and, and get the physical outcomes from that? And um, that's, that's definitely very, very, very apparent. Uh, and I think that's, that's a, a good skill and, and kind of the art of, of working with your coach and trying to get those outcomes um, and doing it in, in the manner that they want. So we're getting physical load um, appropriate for that day, but they're also doing it um, as a function of what the coach would want them to do on the field come, come game day. So I think that's really important. It's something I'm, I'm still trying to get better at, but I think as a, as a group of as conditioning staff, we, we, we should be striving to, to achieve those kind of uh, marrying the two, as, as it were. Um, but I think as well, just just kind of bringing in some of the, some of the last points as well. It's as well. It's it's important. We know how how we can mediate. Um, and Martin touched on these mediate some of these these kind of um, outputs um, through the the provision of a certain environment or, or external training load. So again, um, field sizes and, and kind of constraints are going to have a huge effect on. Uh, the physical output a player can actually attain and as we've said kind of top top end speeds which may not be which may be negated in, in certain smaller tighter areas um, possession based drills may produce a higher average speed and kind of um, work rate meterage with with less um, intermittent high level of accelerations decelerations change of direction um, but also I think we need to remember the, the kind of the cognitive aspects as, as well um, and, and the decision making that's that's kind of enforced on a player uh, in certain drills. Um, so that, that that cognitive load must be kind of factored in. How many interactions and decisions, involvements in, in the game or, or duels, um, certain drills kind of elicit as well. So it's not just kind of the physical piece. Um, it's it's combining the physical, the tactical, and and the cognitive. Um, so again, it's it's all married in um, day to day with with the drills that we prescribe. I appreciate on that one as well, Steve. I think, um, and just to add it in, I think when we talk about marrying up some of the sort of physical stuff from a conditioning or sports science perspective with the technical staff um, or managers, an example, um, and this is in season when we used to monitor, monitor how the how the players responded to to sort of game scenarios, and we did this 
every day, but mainly two days after a game, because that was always when um, the manager and the coaches want, wanted the players back in that training process. Um, from some of the strategies that we use, which may be just looking at muscle soreness or anatomical measures, um, and also some of the external load from the game. If there was a change from that player's sort of norm, um, and when again we'd use some sort of statistical processing for that, we were then able to, and particularly myself, I was able to then have dialogue with the the manager and the coaches on that second day just to say if any of these players, if there was a a change in any of those metrics, and to be mindful. And it wasn't anything. Don't do this or don't do that. Was be mindful that this player has X reduction from an anatomical point of view or a soreness, muscle soreness point of view, and also from that game demand, there's a X increase compared to to normal. So again, it was we were never trying to change or affect the training process uh, to a large extent, but it was always a case of give the information and the intelligence to the coaches and staff. Um, so they have it on board and they would um, quite frequently ensure that those players, it may be, will they take them out of the, the last drill that may be a drill which is based on, let's say, larger spaces and there could be a proponent of high speed run or sprint work, which may then be a risk for that particular athlete. So that's just, a, again, a quick example of how we use some some processes and strategies to, to marry up that communication. No, cheers, Robert. And like, out of curiosity, I'm, I know, again, we could go into a lot of detail on kind of that recovery piece because you'd studied it for a long, long time. Did you ever notice that when you did throw in, either whether it be from the additional technical outputs of match play or whether that be from additional technical actions in games, was there an increase within those kind of muscle soreness or was it just something that there was too many factors really to get any in inferences from it? Yeah, I think this this question probably was the the main part of sort of my work because what we what we were we looked at the external load originally, and there was all the stuff from Tim Gabbett's work about that risk and the the injury prediction factor, and we we were looking at some of these, and then we were doing this years and years ago, and some players can cope, some players can't, and also those players who can, some weeks they can't. So it's so it's so individual, and again, this one size fits all number or approach with regard to external load, I think is, I think has very little impact um, practically. Um, I think at the highest level, and that's where we we looked at. We knew these athletes were responding differently and varyingly um, intuitively, and so we developed strategies and processes to try and quantify that as best we could and and to try and understand those differences and the different origins of fatigue um to best give in information to managers because again like the the, the sort of take-home message is athletes will respond differently between athletes and the same athlete at different time points so using external load or gps or whatever it may be alone and on its on its own is is for me it's not going to be good enough to to really pick up on those refined sort of changes in how athletes respond. Because as we know, there's so many variables. And I think that's something that I've been trying to, well, bang a drum about for a few years now to, because I think we are in, in a sort of period where it's all about GPS and external load. And I think we probably need to maybe move away from that a little bit. It's, it's, it's very, very useful for some of the things we've already spoken about this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, but I think if we're trying to really impact that training process from an intelligence point of view to coaches and, and managers and how athletes are responding, then I think we probably need to look at some more um, different outcome-related measures. No, that's brilliant. And I, I want to come back to, to that a little bit, Robin, as well, but I'm just conscious of time. I forgot to mention it's that unfortunately Martin has to leave the call uh, just with some family stuff going on. So... Just to kind of conclude for you, Martin, like one of the last points on the current slide is about simplifying the complex. So are there any like strategies for communication with coaches, with players, or with even other performance staff or medical staff that you've found really help to clarify that clear message of what 
what you want to do, how are you going to plan it, and the application of it as well. Again, another nice broad question, so apologies. Uh, yes. Um, of course, um, can't forget from where did I get that one, but simplicity and clarity drives action. I think I, I could have that uh, painted uh, above my, my desk, you know. Uh, so simplicity, clarity means uh, big rocks first, selecting information that definitely can have an impact in terms of translating actions, training. So a bit like, again, what, what Robin was commenting. So um, yeah, it's selecting. Um, it's a bit, a bit on, on, on the sideline of, of the, the actual uh, question, but about simplifying, you know. I was I was working with um, when I worked with, uh, with with Laurent Blanc a while ago a while ago now his assistant Jean Louis Gasset who is still probably the, the best uh, the best guy I've, I've ever worked with both in terms of, of person knowledge he knows every single player in the world you know this kind of guy they just spend they don't they don't sleep he doesn't sleep he just <laughs> watch, watch games you know like the, the passion for for that and uh, 60 65 something like that. So imagine trying to come with a GPS uh, data or wellness questionnaires, or I don't know. You just, you're just talking to Chinese. That's someone who does, that only speaks French, you know. And thankfully, I did not insist much because I found out pretty quickly that that would be just running into a wall. And I found out that this guy, for example, the most important things for him was playing minutes. And he would do everything based on playing minutes. And Fair enough. I think it's it's clever. Of, of course, it's clever. The guy would not be there if he if if he was not, you know. But in the end, play, playing minutes is kind of the entry of what happens day plus one, day plus two, Fair enough, depending on how much you played. Um, it also depends. Playing minutes, it's also the the chronic load of your players. He's done a few playing minutes over the last two weeks, so he's done a lot of like he, he did he, how, how many games he played in a row and so on. And you can elaborate a lot on. Oh, this is a guy. This is a thirty minute player minute type of player profile. He's a sub, or this is more that kind of player that that we don't substitute because he plays uh, full matches. So I guess you see what I, what, I'm, what I'm coming, but that's a good example of. Yeah, funneling the information to get something that talks to to someone. So I think that that's that's always a, a good example I, I like to to, to give. Um, but yeah, then I think it's back to again simplicity. The complex is today. Fix fix the team today first, and then you can think about the planning in two weeks uh, at the individual level. You know, so load dynamics day plus two. Day minus two, these are often the, the key days when you make sure you don't mess up the load. Uh, so just talk about that today then and keep the rest for, for tomorrow, you know. So again, as a way to prioritize things and make sure you start with the, 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 the big rocks. That's kind of what I can say in, in, a, in a few minutes like this. Bye, just to, uh, sorry, just to jump in. You mentioned, uh, I know you've got to go, I'm sorry. But um, you know when you talk about manage the load, day plus match day plus one or plus two. And I know we both had a similar experience with regard to particular players wanting to do things like Nordics on a particular day. And also you did some research, a research paper around the sort of eccentrics. Has your, um, your opinion changed on that particular subject? Or what would you, what would you do now? So if it was about a player who's who's regularly playing, where would you sort of prescribe that that sort of eccentric based load, based off of uh, as we as we know we had the same experience and the same um, challenge, let's say. Yes. No, I think I'm I'm still because let's say the so the, 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 maybe the research you mentioned so that everyone can enjoy the the discussion. <laughs> Uh, it's what about where would it be best in theory to fit this eccentric biased types of pressure pre prevention work? Would it be early in the week or midweek? And the research was showing that if you do it too late in the week, that may you may have recovered when you do this work, but then you are not recovered for the next game. So this is the reason, let's say, to do it early in the week. 
But then if you have another game coming up, again, it's, it's also the reason to do it early in the week because if you do it later, you just can't because there's another game. So I would say there's two entries suggesting that it's still better to do it early in the week for the reason I mentioned. Um, and um, I mean, the question came more from anecdotal practices that some of my former colleagues were suggesting. Um, so we tried, implemented the research. The research confirmed more or less what they've been doing. So in a position like the one we have or we, we had, uh, you just have to embrace in this case, if you have practitioners willing to do something, you implement the research that confirms what they want to do, <laughs> you won't be difficult to say, oh, finally, let, let's do it later in the week with contrast with both your opinion and the research. So we just keep, we kept doing it. And um, now end of your question, if I have to do it again, I worked for a few, few weeks in another club since uh, over, over Christmas. That's the first thing I, I started to implement. Low eccentric, day plus one or two, depending on when the day, the, the day off was. That answer the question, Robin, for you? Yeah, no, no, I think it's a, uh... It's always been an interesting, interesting yeah. point. But I think as well, it's good to highlight that it was research based off of like a practical scenario, which I think no, it's, that's where we have to get to. I think from a sports science perspective, if I want to talk a little bit more philosophically. No, I completely agree. It's brilliant, and like the the biggest issue I had with that was, and again, it comes back to that communication piece. Was you from one side of the communication barrier you're saying to the coach okay they play the game they need to recover potentially on a match day plus one on plus two yet on straight away immediately after the game when the recovery might be starting you're then telling them actually we need to do a little bit more work with you so it's an interesting dynamic of one that works with a few coaching staff sometimes it work with others and again it's it's interesting to hear, obviously, certain experiences with yourselves and that, and the different backgrounds of coaching staff. But did you find that that was the same situation for all three of you, really? Like that, sometimes being able to apply things because of the willingness and support of the coach, compared to it being a battle, and sometimes it's a battle that's either worth putting down or you keep having to fight it because you know that it's the right thing. And anyone can dive in on that. Well, no, just if you don't mind, Steve, let's just let me finish this, finish or just answer completely to, to this, this topic. Uh, because I said I'll, I'll need to shoot off in a, in a few minutes. Um, for sure. And as you said, it's, it's a bit of a battle when you try to pull, as you said, first, the first, of course, is, is recovery. The, the most important is recovery, for sure. Especially if you play in three days, if you play in, in a week. Doesn't matter what you do, I guess, too much at day plus one because you can still adjust day plus two or three if for any reason. Think, but first is about recovering. But if while you recover, you're still able to do a bit of work that is going to make you resilient over the next days or weeks, this is where you have to find the right trade off and both the volume, which player is able to cope with that. There will, there's some players that will never cope with that. And for sure, the best way for, for them to recover is just to do nothing. But there are some, some types of profile, depending on their history, depending on their strength level, depending on their experience with these kind of practices, who can actually cope with that and they will benefit from that. So the, the overall message is to really finish the, the, this answer is that um, I would still, I still believe it's, it works. And it's, as I said, I've been implementing it uh, already somewhere in another context but probably with a way more balanced approach into the individualization and maybe more gradually, like working a bit more on, um, on not on eggs, but on slowly to make sure you just uh, adapt the context and you let, you let, you leave everyone uh, adapt as well. Just to, that it's not black and white oh. as, as everything. Yeah, else. and I would, I would echo that. And I would say like, from, from my perspective, I would use any type of and it could be basic basic monitoring um, or response related outcome measures to figure out and be confident which players can and cannot sort of cope with that one i think cultural aspect which is 
can be dangerous if one player is doing such a thing who's probably a genetic freak and able to do that. When other players see them and they copy, I think that's where cultural and communication and, and letting them know, listen, not this isn't maybe for everyone and at every time point for, for those individuals. Exactly. I think that's very important to be added because that changed completely the outcome. Oh, fantastic, Jensen. Martin, appreciate your time. As I do for everyone on the panel, but I'm conscious that you have to go, Martin, and you'll keep talking if I don't tell you to do one, so to speak. <laughs> so thank you again. And Robin and Andy, you can stay on. We'll just finish off the chat. Um, but thank you again, Martin, as well. Good to, good to see you guys. Thank you. Take care. Bye. See you, mate. So I suppose, so I suppose Robin, Robin and Andy, coming back to that point of, I know, Robin, you've already mentioned some forms it, so I'll start with you, Andy, is around that simplifying the complex and strategies for communication. What's kind of been, like, ways for you that's done it? I mean, I know Robin and, Robin and Martin were talking about a, a very probably high-profile experience of uh, Man, Man United and Paris Saint-Germain. I won't go on about our lovely details of what we did when we were at Scunny United together back in 2008 or so, or University Hall, but what's kind of been the experiences like moving forward throughout with regards to that communication piece? Yeah, I think, I think it's hugely important to, to get that, that kind of buy-in and trust. Uh, and as you move between coaches and um, Robin had several experiences of, of very different kind of coaches and characters, philosophies that, that came through at United and, um, it's difficult. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd come in here or, or to another role where the team or the team and, and the, uh, the coach uh, is maybe changing uh, or, or they've got a very different philosophy on certain things. So you really have to, to be a little bit of a chameleon at times to, to adapt to that, that new environment and that coach's kind of preferences, whereas you still need to kind of stick to your guns at times and stay true to your principles, what you believe in and, and what you kind of the objectives you have for the players. Um, coaches operate very differently with, with their fitness coaches. Some of them almost have an assistant coach as, as kind of a, a sports scientist and they have a very, very close relationship. Others um, maybe keep them more, more at arm's length. Um, but understanding, again, as I said at the start, style of play and how you can filter into that, but then how you feed that back. Um, feedback and kind of continual communication is going to be so important in terms of reinforcing things and enabling you as, the, as a physical coach, the, the sports scientist to have impact. Um, so, so when you're providing information on testing, fatigue monitoring, uh, game outputs, training reports and things like that, how, how are you going to get that across to the coach um, without kind of confusing them and, and bamboozling them? So you know, I'm a numbers coach. I've, I've worked with a coach here recently who is who's, I'm so unbelievably analytical. He wants to see every single number. We'll ask about every single player, what his normal um, data is compared to today, why that is, why that is high, why that's low. He'll go through the, the whole kind of uh, barrel of metrics that we have to get a, a detailed answer. But, but others will, will just want a couple of pictures. Are they, are they visual? Is that how they want, they want to see the, the feedback? Or as good as anything is often just a chat. Uh, and, and, and spending five, 10 minutes over, over, over dinner, over a cup of tea with, with the coach and, and running through why, how the session went, why certain outputs came about. Um, but I think it's just having, having that chat. And, and again, in their language, if you can put it in a, in a football language um, that they understand in relation to, to their philosophy, um, that is the most kind of simplest, direct and impactful form of communication, I think. I think that's a really important point that you touched on there is like putting it into that context that they un understand and like I know Martin talked about the match minutes and that and it it's funny it goes back to kind of what we discussed all with reference to the game it's kind of like what most coaches will understand and it's interesting and I don't know whether this is sports science discipline and Robin like kind of touched on it before is that we've kind of led people down a path of looking at physical numbers only because of the technology that's available. Like, so within your experience, has there been that kind of emphasis from a technical and tactical point of view from a training piece on the on the technical side as opposed to the physical side, or is it all just focused to we need to get those physical outputs? We look, we want to get X amount of minutes in the red zone. Robert, Robin, the coach that we both worked with in the past, was very focused on 
red zone minutes, for example. So it's, have we actually, and again, this might, I'm not saying this is our fault, but the information along the line to coaches might have actually clouded their bias to what they want to look at when really, is there a way that we can try and move forward from that and actually help coaches with regards to providing them a more holistic approach to our information. Open that up to you both and these will be the concluding kind of conversations over the last the last five to ten minutes as well. I think I think one one thing I would say at the start is that, that numbers aren't everything and you, you should you should never hang your hang your hat on uh, GPS outputs or, or tracking information like that. Yes, it's a piece of the puzzle. There's many other pieces to that puzzle that, that then inform your decision, which you're you're providing to the coach to potentially make the, the final decision. So it's it's our job to to bring all these different data strands and <clears throat> monitoring or or information that we gather, objective or, or subjective, um, to, to present them to the coach and give them that that informed picture. Um, and again, it also doesn't have to be every new gift and gadget to to measure the players 24/7. It could be as simple as a conversation, as I've said, or or even just using something as a as a subjective RPE, which can have huge value, um, away from any GPS or, or heart rate monitoring system. So, doing doing basic things right like that and consistently can still add huge huge value in terms of quantifying your training, without getting too bogged down in numbers and and trying to get that across to the coach. I don't know what Robin Robin would think on on those kind of themes as well. Yeah, I think um, I think for sure we've become too technology um, dominant and reliant. I think we've maybe forgot to be. I'd say from a sports science perspective, I think we're for, we're forgetting to be sports scientists now. I think we're we're relying on being too hands off. I think the use the 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 rise of GPS is meant that more people are looking at this sort of invisible monitoring type approach, um, which I think is has a, has a place, but is not the be all and end all and can lead us down the sort of garden path a little bit. Um, I think we should, when we talk about technology or the numbers and external load piece, I think we should think about what the question we're trying to answer is first and then see if or what the appropriate method is to answer that. Not necessarily, I was going to say what the best technology is, but it doesn't always have to be technology. I think it can be a simple process or it can be intuition or whatever it may be. But I think, I do believe it's the GPS era has become a little bit of the easy option. And I think there's coaches now coming through um, qualifications or being exposed to fitness coaches, sports scientists at clubs now, which... I think they're really the key people that we need to educate in the right way. I think we, I think if we're creating a numbers based approach, I think we're probably not going about it in the right way. I think again, to reiterate, there's a, there's definitely a place and it can help us certainly, but we need to get away from um, the training or conditioning or a technical aspect of the process being purely based on an external load number. And again, that's, again, it sort of circles me back to why when we started this in sort of 2008, 2009, we, we soon realized through expe like experiential knowledge that we, we need to monitor other things as well. It's not just the GPS and the external load alone that's going to help us. But I think to, to summarize, I think we should really focus on the question first and then appropriately and suitably find the right method. And also we've got to be really careful with how we educate these coaches and, and the coaches coming through about what the data actually means and what it doesn't mean. I think from there, we can probably move forward a lot more efficiently, um, appropriately as sports scientists or conditioning coaches um, to better inform the process and, and impact the practice in a positive manner. Yeah, and just to touch on that, the biggest influences I've had over the most recent, or well, to be fair, all all my career has really been that video piece. Like most people who play football or coach football, soccer, sorry to the US parts that are on here. I knew I would slip up with football and soccer at some point. But 
the video piece is something that everyone can watch and the, one of the best kind of analogies I use within monitoring football is actually you get a coach, a sports scientist, a medical staff member to watch an action in football. They'll all see something differently. But I think actually being able to provide that information quickly, and there's no numbers involved, it's a video piece whereby we can all get our own information from that video is quite powerful. And that's what being one of the biggest influences like within the coaching side and sports science side. So really, I suppose from, from your kind of aspects now and concluding thoughts really, like as I've discussed video and kind of being able to have conversations is one of the biggest things for me. And again, one of the reasons, and I know this is a player maker kind of workshop, but the integration of video piece with, the training piece and match play piece in the future is really important for me. What's kind of been the concluding thoughts for you as to in in the future, what do you want to see that's going to help inform your practice to plan, apply, review and help with the recovery process within your training protocols? And apologies if you hear like a little boy running around now, it's fast time unfortunately. I think um, I, I think again, I just just an, uh, uh, being able to to, to interact and, and work with with the, the the staff around you, particularly the technical staff, without without getting bogged down in in generic conditioning. Try and try and keep it specific, keep it functional for, for the players. Um, and and I think that that brings kind of more bang for buck, particularly in our national team environment, as I said right now. Um, but I think it's also applicable in. In a, in a club environment. Uh, as Robin said, I don't think we should get bogged down too much with numbers um, and, and hanging, hanging hats on that. A high number or a high output isn't always good or a low output isn't always bad. Um, we need to understand as a group, uh, but also educate the coaches that there's context behind every number. There's a meaning behind it and a reason um, for that for the team or for that individual. So I think we always need to keep that in our minds with, with whatever we're collecting. But I think kind of finally, and, and we, we talked about it at the start, is try not to make sure we don't let any of this stuff um, distract or detract from uh, an effectively kind of periodized program, um, getting doing the basics right, and depending on your sport, your season, and, and kind of where you are in the world, um, and, and the level of play. Uh, I think having an appropriately periodized um, program, depending on what model you use, uh, with a good strength and conditioning program to support that, I think doing doing those fundamental things right should be the basis, and then you, depending on resources and, and where you are, you kind of you you work around that and refine those systems, upgrading uh, where you see fit. But it must have impact. It should have impact on your team and your athletes. So, um, Robin, your concluding thoughts on the conversation? On the conversation as a whole, I think. I mean, um, you love a broad question. That's that, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> I think that standard. Yeah. I think like I think you're right when you talk about video. I think that reminds me of I think all those, that interdisciplinary approach where you have a coach, maybe a manager, performance staff, medical team. I think ensuring everyone's on the same page, I think, is really key. And again, if again if video can be part of that vehicle or that vehicle to do that, then that's great. I think what data can provide is a common ground between opinion. So I think like you, your analogy was that everyone will have a different opinion on a video, which is true. Um, a medical practitioner maybe having more of a clinical like injury related opinion on something about movement or whatever it may be. But I think some of the data that we can start to, to use to inform practice can, can be used, I think, from, from my perspective, as the common ground between those opinions. So I think immer immersing everyone on the same page and, and using data in the correct way and like what we've just discussed in the previous question um, as a common ground, I think is, I think is, is probably the way to improve the support and the process and philosophy of planning physical and technical training. And, and I think it also simplifies that as well and also simplifies strategies for communication. No, brilliant. And thank, thank you both for your time. I really, really appreciate it and really enjoyed the conversation. And I hope everyone who's attended tonight and who's watching this on the record function um, has really enjoyed it as well. So thank you again uh, to Andy and Robin. And thank you also to Martin. And thank you to Meg, who um, is on here, but is uh, under 
under the radar helping support the process so thank you to meg as well um yeah that's been a bit longer than 90 minutes so our match minutes are through the roof so to speak um let's just hope we don't train indoors and lose all our gps data so that we can keep track of our monitoring and so on but i appreciate your time gents and i'll touch base with you both individually but thank you everyone else on the call and enjoy the rest of your evening Cheers, Steve. Thanks, mate. Take care. Thank you. Cheers, Robin. Cheers, Andy. Take care. Cheers, Bye. Robin. See you, mate. Yeah, cheers, mate. See you.